streamed on, on Facebook and the recordings will be posted on International Ideas uh, YouTube channel. So warm welcome everyone, all the participants on, on WebEx and all our spectators on uh, Facebook. Um, my name is Lina Rikkilatamang. I'm a director for Asia and the Pacific uh, program at International IDEA. And I'm joining this lecture from Canberra, from Australia, where our regional office is located. And hence would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I live and work the Nunavala people, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Today's lecture uh, is entitled Special Voting Arrangements Between the Convenience of Voting and the Integrity of Elections. And this, is, this lecture is part of the series of online lectures conducted by International IDEA and Friends and the friends include organizations based in Australia, Fiji, Indonesia, Malaysia, Mongolia, Myanmar, Nepal, Philippines, Thailand, and uh, Vietnam. And I would like to uh, let you know that we have a pre-lecture survey is now open for another 10 minutes or so. So it's running for another 10 minutes. Please do fill it in. It provides us a lot of um, valuable information uh, about the regarding the content of this. And there will be a couple of pop up questions during the question and answer session. So uh, keep an eye on your on your screens for for that. Now, um, I'm uh, so very pleased to introduce you today's lecturer my colleague and friend, uh, Therese Pierce Lanella, who is the head of our election team uh, at International IDEA. And she's joining us from Stockholm, Sweden, where it is very, very early morning uh, there at the moment. Um, as many of you know, International IDEA is celebrating its 25th anniversary uh, this year. And Therese is one of those few who were part of the original group in 1995, when IDEA was uh, founded. Um, that was the uh, time of great enthusiasm and number of uh, innovations uh, came up, as many of you have come across with ACE or BRIDGE curriculum, the rest being very much the founding mother of many of those innovations. Already prior, Therese had work on many what we can call uh, truly historical elections. Uh, with UN in Mozambique in 1994, in Cambodia in 1992-93. And um, in between IDEA, she has also worked for, for EU, for UN, Carter Center, IFES, and many other organizations of our field, and is now back at International IDEA. And also, and this is important uh, also in view of our today's topic, she is currently finalizing her PhD on trust in electoral institutions at the Australian National University. I'm so very happy that you are able to join us today, Therese, and um, over to you. Thank you for the next uh, 20 minutes. Thank you so much and greetings everybody, greetings friends, greetings future friends. Uh, it is such an absolute delight and pleasure to be here with you uh, through this technology, imagine that. So you can see out here, as Lena said, it's very early. That's the window up there, that's the darkness and you may see a little bit of light coming in as we move forward through this um, hour and a half that we have together, hopefully. But it is a very dark time of the year here. Um, I'll put the screen on um, and you can look at the PowerPoint instead of looking at my very pale face at the moment. So I'll just share here. Uh, there we go. Excellent. That seemed to have worked. So the topic today is special voting arrangements. And I'm going to assume that um, those of you that are here are um, it, it, 
either working with this issue, or actually I'll, I'll just assume that you're working with this issue. Otherwise, why would you be here? It may seem like a bit of a strange topic. Um, I think those of us who are interested in special voting arrangements are very excited about it in a way that may be difficult to understand for outsiders until perhaps this year hit. And that's what we'll talk about um, during this lecture about what makes this year special and why this topic is just rising and rising in, in interest beyond the small group um, that many of you represent. And it's really, I guess, um, when I think about this topic, I think of it really as where are we going with our elections? What happens next? What is the new frontier? And how are we going to navigate it? So I see this topic from that lens. And what I'm hoping is that you won't mind, although in my paper, I anchored it in many examples and so forth, and the paper is available for you. Um, perhaps Addy can put in the notes a reminder of, of where that is. And I'll also say that on the International Idea website, and I think Adi will put a, um, a link to where we have many, many, many case studies um, about special voting arrangements and about um, COVID-19 elections. So we have a lot of rich, rich data there, a lot of examples. Um, but I want to focus on this, this big picture, this what, what issues has this brought up, this topic? And what are we grappling with? What do we need to know to take forward? And I was kind of hoping that I could use you all because I happen to see in the participants group um, a number of people who have very, very deep knowledge on these topics. So I wanted to use this lecture not so much as me telling, but me putting out some propositions and then testing them on you. And then if we could use the discussion um, section to get feedback. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because I'm noticing that what's arising in one part of the world, so now international idea works globally. So we work with um, uh, election authorities or with regulatory agencies or with non-governmental organizations or observation groups in all parts of the world. And what arises in one part of the world as an absolute truism is in some sometimes the, the opposite somewhere else. And so just just testing. Um, so I had a webinar in Brazil the other day, and that was very, very interesting, the topics that arose there. And then in Portugal uh, just the other day, and now being here with you and just kind of this this circular circumnavigating the globe to just pick up um, what is on people's minds is really, really important for us to build um, a, a holistic picture. So I will use you, uh, the audience, for that today. All right, so just so we're all clear on what we're talking about with special voting arrangements, and it's actually not even clear to us who are working with it. So that's part of what I'm going to test with you today. But just to give a, a little bit of a hint in case there, are, um, a... sorry, I'll just figure out how to, I'm just gonna figure out how to go to the next one. There we go. This is just a, a, a hint of what we're talking about, but I think we're coming to a consensus that it is the type of arrangements that you make uh, in addition to the traditional polling station on election day. So usually it will have to do with um, ways of reaching voters that aren't able to come on election day or that for convenience reasons don't. And so other arrangements are made and it's um, it could be um, a time issue that is they are not available on election day. And so much of advanced voting is about uh, accommodating that, or it's about physicality, not physically being able to uh, arrive at the polling station or not wanting to. And so other modalities are dealing with that, people who are outside the polling station. So that's basically the range. But within that range are a lot of complications, as those of you who are working with this know. And the complications are 
are really what are going to, is going to frame this this discussion as we move forward. And I'm calling it our special voting arrangements journey. Sorry about the acronym, the SVA, but that's just the, the short words to describe this whole set of issues that we're dealing with. Um, I'm calling it our journey because it's it's your journey that you are on right now in your work, but it's also our journey at International Idea and many of you are either member states or our dear friends that we work with so you are with us on this journey and we're in a discovery mode and and this discovery mode is is framed by the two tensions that are part of the subtitle of this lecture which is this idea that yes it is so important to include all voters, they, we must find a way for everyone to be involved. This, this must be our top priority, and especially in a year like this. But on the other hand, every way that we try to accommodate um, people outside the polling station brings a whole set of difficulties that can actually be the Achilles heel of the election or even bring down uh, the election. Um, in case there's accusations of voter fraud, for example. So each one of these alternatives brings a set of risks and vulnerabilities that we need to balance against that participation. So that is the broad framing of the lecture, but the way that we'll do it, just this, is the storyboard that we will walk through is to think of this year in particular. What is the watershed? What, what did makes 2020 special? Why will things be different afterwards than they were before? What is it about this moment? And in that sense, there's two big things, at least for us that have marked this year, and that is um, the pandemic. The reason we're speaking on this by this means and, and not in a conference room. And um, and for us very much the the U.S. elections, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit why I think the U.S. elections in particular are important for us to learn from this year. But also, I want to have a discussion with you um, about our assumptions about special voting arrangements and even why they're special and at what point is normal is special normal and and things that are special in some places might be normal in another so how are we going to navigate a global conversation on these issues to keep kind of keep bring everybody to the to the same level we're struggling with this and i will share our struggles with you and ask for your feedback and then i'm going to test some understandings that are emerging about from what we are learning from all of the um, uh, introducing of special voting arrangements that have occurred this year and, and even those that we followed before. We've been following these very, very closely. But it's a complicated picture and I'll need your help. I'll, I'll test what we're learning on you, but I'll need your help to see if it resonates, if it resonates from your situation or if it's understandable the way that we present it. So that's the idea of the way that we'll move forward. So let's start with this crazy year, 2020. All right, uh, many of you will recognize uh, elements of this picture. These are pictures from Korea, um, which has been really uh, leading the way in how we think about holding an elections in a pandemic. And really, if we'd looked at these pictures two years ago, we would have thought it was a science fiction movie, and yet now it is our reality. And what we've seen is an acceleration of trends that were underway, and that's where special voting arrangements really, really fits. But in a condensed time period that no one could ever have imagined, so think of um, Bavaria introducing all male voting in two weeks, just two weeks to introduce, to move from polling stations to postal ballots. And Korea is an example of that as well, just moving so fast to introduce the health measures that you can see here, the hygiene, the personal protective equipment. Um, and it's this 
condensed period that makes 2020 so interesting. The fact that everybody had to move so fast tested every um, aspect, every dimension of these um, organizations. Um, I'll just, if I have a, a slide a little bit later on that's calling this uh, the stress test for elections. And I don't know how many of you have visited a car factory, but there are um, car factories certainly in Germany where they pick up every 20th car uh, in the testing phase, in the factory phase, and they pick it up and they shake it really, 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 really hard for I think a minute or so. And when they shake it, they can see which little bits are falling out, which little bits are not working as well as they should. And I would say that these pandemic elections have been the equivalent of that for election authorities um, worldwide. And it's, it's tested their um, resilience, their ability to change procedures quickly, and very much tested their ability to cooperate with other agencies, ones that they had no previous relationship in this case. Who would have known as an election authority that you would be dealing with the health authorities? Um, but that is a trend that we were already seeing in areas like cybersecurity, that it was not possible to deal with the threats to elections without a strong culture of interagency cooperation. And so that's one of those learnings that we're seeing this year. And we can see it because it's such a condensed period of time, something that would normally have developed over, um, over years in preparation for an election is now happening in a matter of weeks. With this slide, I just want to remind ourselves that um, this is, is just a slide that I took from Adi uh, and together with this one. Uh, and that is that these um, uh, arrangements that are being um, turbocharged in 2020 are actually part of a trend that was already underway. And that's the only reason I'm showing you these slides um, is that you've probably seen them in various workshops with um, Adi and others um, over the past years. And out of this is um, OCD means out of country voting, but it's the fact that um, uh, the, in some ways the traditional polling station model isn't holding for a variety of groups and out of country people are, uh, people who are out of country is, is one example. But these dilemmas that the pandemic is bringing reminds us of these dilemmas that we had much more time to think about. That is, how do we reach people who aren't um, immediately available in the community? So that the only reason I'm showing you these slides then is just to say that um, the, the interesting thing about the pandemic has been the acceleration, but many of the trends were already underway and special voting arrangements, trying to find ways of reaching people um, through other means is, is one of them. And of course, we can also mention that um, uh, not only out of country, but also out of district. So we imagine um, places like Malaysia, for instance, with great um, urbanization, where the electoral authorities, and some of you I hope are here, or, or um, legislators, are thinking carefully about how do we reach university students or people who are in the city to um, efficiently make sure that their poll is, uh, that their vote is counted. So these, these dynamics of trying to figure out how to accommodate voters in a changing society is, is just part of our reality, We're now turbocharged with this. And one more thing I'd like to mention is the expectation of voters, um, this kind of convenience um, expectation. And this is something to keep in mind in terms of the 2020 watershed is that the special me measures that we introduced this year for the pandemic, um, they may be difficult to retract later on. And so they may be becoming or will let, they may well be becoming part of our, our new normal. So we imagine, for example, that special voting arrangements that were formally only for a small group um, of people who had a particular reason. Um, now in many jurisdictions, many countries and many states and many cities, um, for this year that was extended to the whole population. Now will it be possible to bring it back again and what implications does that have for cost and, and for how we organize elections in the future? So my basic point is these trends were already underway 
accelerated this year um, and what's going to happen after this? What, what do we keep? What do we go back to? Um, is there any going back to before? Um, and this is just a, a quick slide um, that shows trends in, in, in Europe. And my reason for showing um, these slides, we've been working intensely with um, uh, in Europe on various forms of special voting arrangements. And we're really noticing, as you can see from, from just these, these maps, that there's um, often some um, cultural context involved in terms of what's acceptable in one place or another. And there's also infrastructure issues where something that is super easy in one place is more difficult in another place. And this is just to flag that there is no one size fits all, but it's also to flag that we are learning from each other. So in this map will change as those in the blue field, for example, in the various maps are learning from those in the orange field um, in these maps. And there's a lot of um, cross-border learning, uh, just as this is very much the case in, in um, Asia and the Pacific. And I just wanted to show you that that dialogue is going on in other parts of the world as well. So here, my point is just that um, um, these trends, as I said before, they were underway, they are accelerated, but they will look different in different places. And that's kind of okay for reasons that we'll go through. So um, what do we mean? Um, why? Okay, sorry, I was just distracted by, by the chat, but I'll try not to be distracted. We can look at that a little bit later and anybody else is welcome to, uh, to answer. So the reasons for um, introducing special voting arrangements um, and before the pandemic, they always existed and they're listed here. And the number three is certainly the one we're thinking about this year, but it was always, um, and I'm just giving you this list for, for, for due diligence. So we're all on the same page, but also if you could just remind us if there's something that we're missing, because we're working towards um, a primer or a handbook. And so I'm testing some of these out on you. And if you could just let me know either in the chat or afterwards in the discussion, what we're missing. So we're thinking it's people who are away, um, as I was saying before, or abroad, official duty is a very important category. Um, and that's one where that the official duty one has really been the, the, the forerunner uh, for special voting arrangements. It's, it's, it's always the one that's come, come first. For example, in the UK, it was already in the 1940s um, that postal voting was brought in for uh, the military and then stayed after that and is now available to the general population. Um, conflict and security sometimes um, has, has an impact. Um, we can see that in some parts of um, uh, South Asia, for example, where certain areas are, are affected. Incarceration, that it means people who are in, in prison or, or not able to, to leave where they are. Um, they're not on the voters list. This is the case for, for um, certain temporary measures um, where you provisional ballots. And then voter convenience is one that's really, really on the rise. So do let us know if this, um, if this list is, is, is missing anything. And here I want to test the uh, proposition. And, um, and that is the way we're thinking of, of, of framing this. And, and does this ring true for you? And that is the reason we're using the word special is because we still believe that the ordinary, the, the one you see on the picture, the, the polling station is the gold standard. And the, it, it's a gold standard for, for many reasons. Um, and the most important one perhaps is the fact that it's a controlled environment. Um, and that speaks to the integrity part of this dilemma. It is a controlled environment where there is a proximity. It's very close. The voter, the checking that the voter is eligible, the seeing that the voter is the voter, the voter receiving a ballot paper, often in, in visible to, to political party monitors, candidate monitors, or to observers, 
or to the general public sometimes. Um, and it's visible that they go behind the polling uh, booth and then that they come out and they put it in the ballot box. That is um, a tried and tested way. Um, thanks to all of you in Australia for, for having uh, uh, perfected it uh, 100 years ago and um, shared it with the rest of the world. Um, but, and so all of these other arrangements are moving back from this gold standard. And before, I move away from this idea of the polling station as a gold standard, because it may be that we are being nostalgic and anachronistic when we are too attached to the polling station. But I'm thinking that we don't want to lose this attachment just yet. And that's also for the other reason. And that is this almost, maybe I'm going too far, but if I say almost sacred ritual um, of walking down to that station and 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 um, meeting your neighbors and and performing that civic duty. And this was described very well in, in a lovely book, which I can highly recommend, it's called um, Ritual and Rhythm and Electoral Systems by Professor Graham Orr. And he talks about um, uh, the election, the polling place as, as a ritual that is important for us as citizens to feel a part of our country. So when we move to convenience, let's also keep that in mind is, is what are we losing? And I think we all know that it's a losing battle, um, that, that this polling station is, we are moving away from it. But I just want to um, have your insights to where we are on the spectrum to how quickly we can move away from, 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 from the polling station. Or is it the case that we can say the polling station is the main one, and then these other forms of special voting um, arrangements are supplementary. That's where we're leaning at the moment, but I'm very interested to hear your, your thoughts. So I was saying that this was the, the um, ultimate um, stress test for, for elections, and that was because the polling station, which is the place where most electoral authorities put the, the procedures are written for polling stations. Um, the materials are developed for polling stations. The civic education is developed for polling stations. And yet it was precisely polling stations where you could not be. Um, you did not want to gather people in one place. And that's what polling stations do. So almost, you know, there's, there's a few sectors who have been hit really, really hard, and we feel for the, the culture sector, um, um, the theaters, and uh, music, and so forth. But elections have really, really had it tough um, this, this, this year. Um, and we've learned from each other. And I just want to, um, again, highlight this, this um, when things move quickly, the importance of learning from each other. And I think that's where um, International Ideas um, uh, Asia and Pacific team are doing such a lovely job of just facilitating that conversation when you're curious about introducing something. And then you have the opportunity in, in a very safe environment to just explore that. And we noticed that the Korean example really resonated throughout the world. Now, in Korea, they expanded their early voting, they extended postal voting, um, and they considered other things but couldn't bring them through. But their measures, plus the, the hygiene measures, as I showed you before, the case study that you can see here that was written by um, one of our colleagues in the Asian Pacific office, Antonio Spinelli, that went viral. And we had calls from, from Canada and other parts of the world saying, how do we learn? So this, this learning, we see this cascade learning going on. And I think that's one of the, if I think of 2020 as a watershed moment, um, I've already mentioned a number of things, but I just want to put this one in the mix the importance of peer learning. And the importance of peer learning is why I think the US elections in particular are so important. There are many important elections this year um, for many, many different reasons, um, whether it's, it's Hong Kong or Brazil or Myanmar or many important ones. But from a special voting arrangements point of view, I think the US is the most interesting. It is the most interesting because um, 
it is so decentralized, which is a very odd thing for many of us who have centralized authorities and, and believe in centralized authorities. But it means that there's an experimentation going on uh, in a way as they are dealing with how this issue is playing out. These special voting arrangements, as you will have noticed, anybody who's watching the news cannot have missed it. Um, they are becoming uh, infected, polarized. Uh, this issue of postal voting is being um, given the equivalence of, of voter fraud. Um, as one example of, of how the, an issue that seems like an administrative issue is turning into a political issue, um, we're noticing that it's a societal issue um, as the discussions in the United States about who are the most vulnerable, who are the most vulnerable to COVID-2, uh, to, co to COVID, to the COVID virus, but who is also, um, who are the most disenfranchised. So this discussion about um, the disenfranchised and the vulnerable is underway. And the other thing that's interesting about the United States at the moment is the amount of litigation, the amount of um, uh, testing in court, the measures that are being introduced. And so let's watch this space very, very closely. I think we will see um, many, many um, uh, difficulties for the authorities that are involved, but I'm imagining that we will also see um, um, innovation that will um, affect the way that voting is done globally after after this. So let's let's watch this space. All right, so I've given you um, uh, a sense that 2020 was very important. And so now I just wanna move forward to how we're trying to consolidate this. And, and here's where I'm going to really, really need your help. First one is definitions. I've tried to explain why we picked special, but this um, shows that we could have picked many, many other words. And we could have picked al alternative, convenience, exceptional, or unconventional. And we've landed on special for the reasons that I outlined, but I just want to check with you if, if, if you feel that that holds. So the idea is um, polling station as your gold standard, but these things that are being introduced are, are, we're treating them as special because they are not in that controlled environment. And so we need to pay special attention to them. So even if they become normal, they will still need special attention. I hope that kind of justifies it. Um, it. Really, all could be fine, but we're going with this one. And then this idea of whether it was arrangements or measures and so forth. Now, I would actually use different words depending on which ones. I would probably use measures when I think of well, which measures are going to be put in place in this pandemic, for instance. Um, but uh, he and so we do tend to use these other words uh, as as well in, in text, but we're sticking with arrangements because of our natural affinity with election management bodies. That is our, um, at least in our team, the, the team that that you're with now, is is this um, those who actually have to put the arrangements in place. So that's that's what we're playing with right now, and I'm, I'm really interested in your thoughts. Um, and this is the full list that we're thinking of at the moment. I won't read it up, but I'll just um, just let you read it for a, uh, a few, just to, I'll let you read it through. And if you notice anything that's missing, and I can see that Michael Maley, one of our participants is actively using the chat function. That is excellent. I encourage you all to use it we will be taking note of everything that's in there. So in case you don't have time to say it, um, we'll use the chat function. But what have we missed? What have we um, categorized wrongly? Um, grateful for your thoughts. And if there's any issue of what these mean, um, perhaps language issues that, that because these are in English um, and it may not be everybody's first language, uh, some are obvious, but just that proxy voting, I'll just explain, that's when somebody else votes for someone. Um, for example, an elderly person may send um, their carer and, and put the ballot through that person. And provisional was what I was mentioning before about um, if, if you're not on the voters list that you get something that's temporary, or perhaps if you're not in your constituency, you get a ballot that's in an extra ballot. 
So those are the ones we've come up with, but it's been a real challenge. This is gonna be hard to read, but I just want to um, show it to you as the way that we're thinking right now. So what we're thinking is that what type of special voting arrangement you're going to put in place will really depend on who you are trying to help. So that's our idea for how we will frame this issue moving forward. Oh, thanks, Michael, for the, um, the extra ones. That's great. Um, Michael Maley just put um, some extra categories for us. Um, and I'll just show you what this would look like filled in. So this would be different then for different jurisdictions and would show that there's no one size fit all, but it depends on who you are trying to target. Um, and so our suggestion is then that we could fill in this one in a way such as this one. So here we are matching, for example, health related needs, that that's a good match with the mobile ballot box, um, bringing it to um, to homes um, or, or, old, or old age homes and, and so forth. So this is our broad thinking of how we will frame this. I'll just leave it up for just a moment um, in case this is helpful for your own thinking um, of what you have on your menu at the moment or where you might be heading. And here also, um, if we've gotten something wrong or if we've misunderstood something. So that's our thinking at the moment. And as two final points, um, so we can get the discussion going, because I'm guessing that I'm using up my time very, very rapidly. I've way used up my time. Okay, these are my final two points, are the do's and the don'ts um, sections. And let me just remember them. Um, written them down, um, but otherwise I will just. Okay, the vulnerabilities and the risks and the unintended consequences are really showing themselves this year. Um, we just have to look at the, um, uh, the, the, the mobs shouting voter fraud, voter fraud, it sends chills uh, down any uh, election um, authority or, or any legislator's um, spine um, to imagine that something that you've introduced um, will be seen in that way. It is, um, uh, it, there, there are, it's it's just shown the amount of controversy um, around. Uh, for if we think of already in, in um, earlier this year, in in Poland, um, the the idea to move to um, all postal voting was highly controversial. Whereas in other parts of the world and in the United States, um, when authorities didn't move to postal voting, that was highly controversial. So just to show that. Um, the risks around this topic are many, and the risks come from this tension uh, that we that is framing this this topic. Is that the more you move towards participation, the less control you have. You cannot guarantee the secrecy. You have you are opening to vulnerabilities. Um, every um, changing of hands of these, uh, whether it's the, the ballot boxes that are outside, um, brings with it some risks. And even, even, even advanced voting, which is um, um, really quite in a controlled form, but perhaps it doesn't have the observation, for example, that a polling station voting does. So is that okay? What tolerance is there in society for accepting those risks to get those participation dividends? That is the societal conversation that has to happen. So here's what I'm saying. There are risks. There are un unintended consequences. And all of these special voting arrangements have inherent vulnerabilities to them. But the flip side is each of them enables a part of the population that otherwise wouldn't vote. That's a real good thing that we need to work towards. So how do we mitigate those risks or accept them? 
And what we're learning, uh, and just before I move away from this, because I'm going to say what we're learning that helps with that, is I just want to remind of one thing, which isn't to do with being controversial, but just that each one brings cost and administration implications. Once you introduce a, a type, new type of voting, it's difficult to bring it back. So I know that many uh, are under pressure with the cost of elections. So each one of these will build it. So that's part of the societal conversation too, is what appetite do we have to pay for these and to organize them properly, which takes resources. So if there is a political push to introduce, um, for example, postal voting more widely, or um, smartphone voting, whatever it is, there needs to be also the resources that come with it. If there is that societal will. So here I come right to the end, um, um, which is um, one of the lessons that we're learning is we've always known it. Here's the electoral cycle that you recognize, but it's that in this compressed time period, there wasn't the time to go through this full cycle. So we have to make sure that whatever was done this year was temporary and that anything in the future goes through the full cycle um, because there's a lot of um, corners that have been cut and that will um, bite us in the uh, behind um, later on. So just to um, keep in mind the that um, any of these arrangements need to go through the full electoral cycle and preferably um, several cycles. So um, I'm going to end with um, what was uh, written also in the paper. And I'm really, really testing here now. But if we look at those who have managed well, and many have, we have seen a, a resilience and a resourcefulness and a cooperation that has been absolutely extraordinary and beautiful to watch. And here's the three things that I'm picking out, but maybe there's more and maybe there's um, a, a different way of, of framing them. And one is that we cannot lose sight of the, the technical aspects. These small procedural details, we're seeing them play out now on, for example, um, envelopes in New York, for instance, um, where signatures go, how something goes back, the, these transfers, the, the forms that accompany something throughout at every stage. These procedural details matter. And so even though these are being discussed at the political level, we mustn't forget that um, it is these details and procedures that can make the difference uh, in terms of the integrity dimension. Secondly, um, the importance that the rules and the reasoning why something has been chosen is, is, is clearly known and that the, the, the how it's going to work is clearly laid out. And it, sometimes things have gone so fast now and it's there's been a confusion about how something's going to work. So just that, that the rules, whatever they are, are clear and absolutely laid out. And thirdly, and this is going to be the most important one, is this sense of shared purpose. Those who have navigated well this year have been able to ally the general sense of the population, what needs to happen, whether it's to postpone elections, as was the case in, in France, for those um, second local, round of local elections, it was a general sense that it needed to be postponed. And the legislators, they worked so hard to change the laws to enable that postponement, which was societally needed. And the political parties also um, gave their support to that. So when there was an alignment between uh, the agencies, the health agencies, the electoral agencies, the legislators who needed to push something through, um, and the political parties not playing silly games with these, but actually um, standing behind it, that's when things went well. And I think that's the lesson that we need to take moving forward as we introduce um, special voting arrangements in the future. So as we move to the discussion now, I just want to say that I'm not the expert who can answer everybody's questions, but the experts are amongst you, um, the participants. So while I'll let Lena guide us, I would like um, any questions to be to all of us, really, and that we together navigate it. And I'm also very keen for your feedback on this framing that we have um, right now. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you so very much, Therese, for that, uh, for that very wonderful overview and, and also putting forward those, those questions. Um, yeah, it, this is truly the hot topic of 2020. And as you, um, as you rightly say, we are only halfway of the, of the journey of finding these answers. There are so many unknowns and probably many aspects that we haven't really yet thought about, or at least don't know how they will work in, in practice. So I also encourage you um, to put forward your, your questions uh, through chat box and either put there to everyone, if you want everyone to see them, or if not, at least all panelists, so I can see them and and uh, and, uh, Chris and uh, myself can see them and I can convey the questions forward. And as mentioned, we're very keen on hearing your uh, experiences as well, or, or your reflections and, and, and thoughts. Um, we thought we should start with the poll, since Therese brought up this question of the concept, what should we call the special voting arrangements or something else? So we do have a quick poll question there. Uh, which term do you think is most appropriate? A, special voting arrangements, or B, alternative voting methods? Obviously, we could have put C, something else, but it's hard to put that into, into a quiz like that. So again, please feel free to use the chat box and propose an Third option, if none of, if neither of these, you think is is the is the really the accurate one, and as we know, it will take some time before the concepts um, stick, so to speak. So we will probably know within a few years' time which one the world will start um, using. So here we have our results. Um, there seems to be a slight preference for the alternative voting methods. It's it's close call. There is six uh, um, out of four, 13 is saying special voting arrangements and uh, seven uh, voting for alternative uh, voting uh, voting methods. I know uh, I know Therese that you were um, one of those people who were once upon a time. Uh, reflecting about how do we call all these institutions that organize elections, yeah. ministries and uh, commissions and whatnot. And it eventually we all call them, most of us call them EMBs, electoral management bodies, but it was not, uh, it, it was, it didn't fall from the sky. It was also a, a product of intense discussions and, and debates. And I believe this one, this one will be as well, do you want to comment on the on these results in any way before we go to the, the questions? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll we'll think about it. Um, uh, yeah, you, uh, this is really fun, and and you should see the internal traffic uh, in in our uh, internal emails as well. Um, <laughs> as we as we go back and forward and and we've also done um uh we did a google search as well to see okay. which terms were, were were coming up um so it, it took us a while to land on special voting arrangements but i'm we're still um we may use alternatively and and i should say that odir um a wonderful organization that we cooperate greatly with in europe um the osce odir they are have chosen alternative voting methods so um well, yeah, <laughs> so we'll take this into right. consideration. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> still out on, on that one. But, yeah, on terminology, I think I think just your point is right, Lena. I've, I've been um, uh, 28 years now working with, with elections, and some of you I see in the participants have been in, even longer. And um, it takes a while for sometimes a term to get sticky. And then once it sticks, it really sticks, even if it's not the best term. And I think EMB is an example of that. And I feel a bit guilty about that one. Um, but it's just, we were organizing a big conference and, and couldn't find the word that kept both commissions in, but also the small administrative unit, which in Sweden at the time was the tax department, a small unit inside the tax department that was, um, that was organizing elections uh, and like how did you put that in the same as like the Indian Election Commission which was such an important agency 
And that's where we came to the term electoral management bodies. Good. Um, uh, that uh, that debate, I'm sure, continues. Um, mm -hmm. Moving on to some of the questions and, and comments, there is a couple related to uh, postal voting, and particularly uh, comment that Kobal uh, Sivakoti and few others that there are it is becoming more and more accepted uh, process postal votes and established in many countries. But then again, in some places, those ballots really are printed at the last hour. Um, so leaving no time for postal exchange, any advice on, on that? And there was one that related to the very first question regarding, I guess this is one of those declarations that you need to attach to your, your um, uh, can someone explain what does it mean when you have to say sworn declaration from the postal voter saying that the vote has been cast in person, unobserved and unaffected, and the vote has been cast in secret? For this one, I, can I can I suggest um, that um, Michael Maley, who's here, um, tells about how the debate was in Australia and what it took, the steps that it took to introduce postal voting and why these choices were were made. I think that that case um, would it, it and, and also how many years it took, like what steps, um, because this is really these are complicated issues that it can't be treated lightly. And so uh, would, would Michael be up for anything? Michael? Okay. I don't know if you can hear me because I haven't switched the microphone on. Ah, okay. okay. Right. You can hear oh, me? Yeah, if you, yeah. if you yeah. wish. Okay, there's a long history of postal voting in Australia going back to about 1911. Um, in its early um, form, it was limited to uh, very restricted classes of people and it was subject to a witnessing requirement which limited the witness of the postal voting process to, a, again, a limited class of public officers, which meant that they were responsible for ensuring that the postal vote was cast in circumstances as required by the law, in other words, secretly, uh, without undue pressure and that sort of thing. And the witness became ultimately an extension of the election administration. That was the case uh, pretty much up until the 1960s, where the class of uh, people who could be witnesses was greatly expanded. And by 1990, um, the law had again been amended so that um, there was no longer any sort of obligation on the witness to ensure that the law was being complied with during the act of postal voting. At the same time, and in parallel, there were developments in the details of how postal votes could be applied for, which made it much easier for someone to get a postal vote. In a sense, in, in essence, they didn't have to specify a particular reason, they simply had to assert that they were qualified for a postal vote. So it, it has transitioned in the last 100 years or so from being an exceptional arrangement, uh, lim quite precisely um, implemented, uh, to being just another alternative voting modality which people can choose if they want. You can now, at a federal election in Australia, apply for a postal vote um, over the internet, and it's an extremely simple, straightforward process, um, which in fact I used at the recent Eden Monero by-election. Uh, so uh, there's been that sort of evolution. And the concern I think that, that some of us would have is that forgotten in a, a lot of this is the role of the polling station as a state guaranteed place where a person can vote without being subject to any pressure. A lot of the debate mm -hmm. in America seems to be about whether postal ballots can be interfered with after they've been cast, you know, grabbed by party officials or otherwise misdirected by the, the postal service or whatever. Um, but the great concern from my point of view is that people who are voting by post aren't being given the advantage which people have at a polling booth 
of being protected by the polling officials from any attempts to subject them to undue influence. Um, and as Sarah Birch has pointed out in quite a lot of detail in her publications on internet voting, family pressures can be really mm -hmm. quite significant, particularly in a highly polarised election such as is being seen in the USA, but also as is seen in many countries. Um, the, the sort of family pressures that people might uh, be susceptible to when they're marking their ballots around the dining room table as distinct from in a voting compartment is not something that should be forgotten. And uh, Jörn Elkland and I wrote about this in our paper last year in the Journal of Democracy. Right. And and um, Pak Hadar, are you here with us? I'm just wondering, I, I thought I saw Pak Hadar in the... Um, I hate to put him on the spot. We can uh, we'll we'll call him uh, after after a while if he if he is around. Okay, if if you um, because I, I think this this issue of of um, or if anybody else is would like to speak from from Indonesia or Malaysia, uh, but yeah, go ahead. Is is that Pakadar? No. Um, but it just the the, the Malaysian or, or Indonesian um, experiences of out of country voting with with postal voting would be really interesting to hear from as well yes, and how they're navigating that. Uh, hi, Teresa and Lena. Yes, I am here. Hi. Yeah, you, you've you've had lots of experience over the years with trying to figure yeah. out how to deal with those. Um, no, no. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, we are the Indonesian that like to learn from you that have been observing the. Uh, all election in this uh, uh, very unfortunate time of pandemic. So, um, yeah, we are facing a quite difficult situation here uh, because uh, very soon uh, in December 9, there will be a, a local election, which is quite a big one. It's half of the country, in fact, uh, you know, basically uh, over 100 million uh, voters expecting to, to involve in this. Um, so, uh, but the decision already made by the authorities, which is now is not only the EMB, but also uh, government and the parliament, uh, civil society, and in fact, most of the public through the uh, uh, surveys, uh, many surveys, shows that uh, they uh, worried about uh, having it in this coming December. Because actually, there is no what you call it special uh, voting procedure, which I I think it uh, should be an alternative. Sorry, uh, um, uh, threats uh, alternative voting procedures. Mm -hmm. But anyway, there is there is no such a thing uh, introduced uh, in Indonesia. So um, so we are worried. But anyway, it looks like uh, they will continue, and uh, for one reason. Uh, uh, it's there is no one can say when is the pandemic will be over, and secondly, it they say it will ruin the democracy itself because um, there is this, uh, the term of this uh, head of the regionals will be finished very soon, so we need to have a new one. So that's mm -hmm. be, uh, becoming uh, their second big reason why to to do it in this coming December. But anyway, um, so uh, uh, just the protocol, uh, health protocol against the COVID will be implemented. Uh, that's what they plan, uh, which uh, I think, or many Indonesian friends uh, will see, uh, we, the public, is not very disciplined to do, to do so you know, wearing the mask and keeping the distance, physical distance and so on. But anyway, they, they believe this could, uh, uh, could be, could, uh, up, be applied. Um, so anyway, um, the question that I raised to you actually uh, about uh, using a, a technology, uh, instantly the response of the public think uh, using technology by uh, internet voting, for example, uh, this is the chance to do it. This is the the option that should we use it because they think a lot of us are using technology now. Uh, but as the information here, none of this being prepared actually. You know, 
So I just wonder whether during this pandemic, the practice in many other countries, is this also an issue that, you know, a lot of publics will say, okay, why don't we use this uh, internet uh, voting, for example? Uh, is that the, also the, the debate? Uh, is it, uh, you know, you uh, have been observing in many countries. I personally think it's not because, you know, this is more complex and we have to prepare it, uh, you know, uh, very well. Um, but Indonesia haven't done that. So uh, what we have in mind is what you have uh, been presenting, uh, those special voting arrangements like postal votes, um, early voting, and so on. Uh, but then the authority think uh, we just go on with what we have, you know, the conventional one, going to polling stations. And uh, so uh, it, will be like, it will be like that. Uh, so um, that's the situation, um, uh, Lena and Trace and everyone in the in the forum uh, in uh, Bora, uh, Indonesia. Thank you, thank you, Bakadar, for for yeah. that uh, for that account, um, and I think that uh, that really actually links with the question or comment question that we have from uh, Sofia Martinez de Castro, also from Mexico, who is uh, wondering about this: How do you how do you go about selecting the special voting arrangements that really would meet specific population or or the the uh, society, and making sure it doesn't impact the cost by voters, and that could affect in the whole election? Um, I think that's that's really what we're coming into is this: how do we best build trust on these new uh, systems? I, I suppose we all would agree that it takes time and positive experience, but uh, what else? What are the what are the ingredients of uh, for the EMBs or the electoral authorities to build trust on these new new type of systems and to introduce them? Yeah, I guess the 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 first word that comes to mind is is pilots, <laughs> pilots, 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 and and for that I, I'm wondering. Um, uh, you've just had the elections in in Canberra where you are, and I see that um, that Jiv uh, is on the line, or or any others from the, the the Canberra office, because I think this this issue of pilots or introducing something, I really see Canberra as as a uh, a leader in the just the. The way that it rolls out something in, in lock in, in together with the the people and the politicians, and not too much in advance and not too much behind. It, it feels like it's hitting the sweet spot. Maybe it's just me as uh, from the outside, but that's what it looks like. But you just experienced it right now, and I'm wondering if if Jif would be willing to respond to that Mexican question from the perspective of what you've just been through with them. Um, uh, experimenting with um, uh, technology in the polling stations, for instance. Would, would Jeff, would would you be up for speaking, or anyone from the Canberra office, the ACT office? Sorry. Um, sure. Can Can you hear me? Or yeah, yeah, yep. yes. Okay. Great. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, it's okay. Um, sort of not sure where to start, but I think um, uh, I, I guess in, in terms of this this election, I, I suppose we had. Um, I, I guess our commission, um, we've been trying to advance a few things um, ahead of COVID in any case, in terms of, I guess, new new um, products or services that we're trying to roll out. I think with um, with COVID, I think it probably just accelerated that. Um, I'm thinking in particular of our, um, I suppose, um, electronic um, online voting service for overseas electors based in the ACT. Um, that's probably something that um, we were trying to roll out. Well, it was something we were trying to roll out prior to COVID anyway, uh, just with the um, sort of slowdown in postal vote processing, particularly with respect to getting postal votes back from overseas locations, etc. So I think that was planned anyway. It just sort of fortuitous that this sort of happened and postal vote delivery time frames are slowed down even further than kind of what we thought originally. So um, that little pilot <laughs> became a bit more significant than kind of what we thought. Um, so 
Yeah, I think, you know, there's always, I guess, things that we're trying to do here because we're a smaller jurisdiction and because we've got this sort of technolo technological capacity to do it on a small scale where we can try to do things like that. Yeah. Um, but certainly, I think this election sort of gave us even more reason to do that. So specifically with um, relaxing the early voting restrictions, with pushing early voting much more um, in much more larger numbers with enhancing electronic voting um, early in the pre-poll scenario. I think that sort of, it all enabled us to do that in a way that probably um, was fortuitous and it was, uh, well, you know, it was certainly mandated by the requirements of just dealing with the COVID safe election. But um, I think we were sort of generally heading towards some of these um, services in any case, and it sort of sped things up a bit um, and sort of tested them <laughs> in a yeah. way that probably we weren't expecting. So it was a difficult election in many fronts, but um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. But... Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. And indeed, we had uh, also a um, comment here. Um, from Depra Taylor, uh, as well pilots, but also co-designed and user testing, including people who are blind with limited literacy. And her comment already earlier was also when when, he, when there was uh, Therese, you asked the question if all the groups were in, in, included, people with disabilities who would not be able mm -hmm. to um, to attend uh, in person voting. And I guess. Um, uh, the uh, one group, um, another group might be the migrant workers, uh, in a sense that obviously there was a group of people who are abroad, but you may be in a, abroad for so many different reasons, and often it is not that much voluntary when you when you are, and it, often that group embassy voting may not be an option, but you may need to find uh, uh, the ways come much closer to the people uh, wherever they are. Uh, working. Um, Lena, on that, are there any participants who have experience with the, the migrant workers issue? Because I know that has been in, in uh, the United States right now, they're talking about this idea of ballot harvesting. That is when a group is somewhat coherent and, and where you have you know, where someone may have leverage over a whole group. This speaks to Michael Maley's early point too about um, family voting, but there's, um, you know, around the table, but a, a family that's tough on the individual, but it's still only four or five people. But um, once you start talking about a, a, you know, a plantation or a military unit or something, like how how do you navigate the, the personal, in, you know, the, the Mm. The individuals, mm. and I'm just wondering if any of the participants have any, any experience about how to break any kind of maybe cultural issues around or, or power issues that might affect the secrecy of the vote for, for migrant workers, for example. It's a tough question. Um, yeah, yeah, there is maybe. We'll see if somebody, someone, uh, no someone wants to talk about it. But uh, what I know for sure is that in uh, Myanmar elections up and coming now, November eight, and was initial thoughts that the Myanmar EMB asked collaboration of the Thailand EMB to organize the voting for the migrant workers on the border of uh, Thailand and Myanmar, uh, not not, not to go, so that the people don't have to come to the to Bangkok and to the embassy, which would be sort of um, very hard for these people to do, but it would be organized somewhere near the near the border. Now, with the COVID situation, that plan needed to be uh, aborted, but that was something that they were, uh, they were really uh, trying to think about. Actually, there was also a comment here earlier from the from BNG that indeed, not always the in-person polling day is necessarily a gold standard if when, oh. when the polling stations are so far, uh, so remote and and uh, that we do need to think about the SVAs also for mm -hmm. for these uh, mm -hmm. these groups. 
was asking Ari that we could maybe this would be a good moment to do the second quick poll and see. Uh, do we think? Do you think proxy voting violates the principle of secrecy? Yes or no or don't know. This relates to the question issues that we just discussed about uh, voting around a around a kitchen table or or any other pressures that people uh, may feel. Or letting someone else to know what uh, what your views are, or or even risking that the other person decides for you, for that matter. Then again, uh, there are times you may you are not able to uh, come in person, and you would like to use the opportunity for proxy voting. So we will allow. While you're asking, I have two more. Uh... Just, um, I have another question. If there's anyone from the sure. Philippines, and, and no need to to speak it out here, but um, I'm really interested about the um, experiment that was done with um, Filipino sailors with smartphone voting, and just how that went. So, um, if anybody has, I, I think I saw someone from the Philippines. So, if anybody has any intel on that, we'd love to know how that how that worked out. Um, speaking to Hadar's point earlier that people are going to start to expect to be able to vote on their phones. And so it's always interesting to watch those those first experiments. And I know the Philippines are leading on that. Hmm. Indeed. Also, uh, I, do, do yeah. share that uh, through the through the chat or, or ask for the floor. Very happy to hear from you in person or then even afterwards send us a send us a message. So interesting. Majority seems to think that uh, indeed proxy voting violates uh, secrecy. Twelve votes uh, and a couple of uh, saying no and C don't know. It's very interesting given that the proxy voting is uh, is a method that is uh, in the toolbox of uh, of a voting methods. If if there is uh, quite a big uh, and yeah, and here here we come to the 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 appetite for risk or trust issues, which is huh. yeah, probably does compromise secrecy. I think we'd all have to agree with that. You know, anything that is somebody on their kitchen table and giving it to someone else and somebody carrying it is going to compromise secrecy. But is it worth it? And that's yeah. where the, the trade-offs, like, is it worth it? Um, and this idea that you err on the side of inclusion, but this, this idea, which I think many of us really appreciate the err on the side of inclusion, if in doubt, include it. If, if a ballot might be valid, might be invalid. If it's in doubt, include it because it would be worse that they didn't get counted. That's only possible in, in a high trust environment where everybody's like, yep, that's what we'll do. The minute you get that switches to a, a very tense environment, the opposite dynamics um, occur. And that's where you really can't take any risks because the smallest thing that goes wrong in, for example, something like proxy voting will be the thing that shows up on social media or, or something as, as an example of something that is um, a disaster and shows that the whole elections are, are fraudulent. And that's where these extra kind things that are put in place to make it easier for someone suddenly become your real Achilles heel. It becomes the entry point for some, some real toxins. And I've just seen it again and again where it's that um, I, I had the great pleasure of, of working in Tunisia for one of the elections, and they did such a good job. But they had um, an embassy uh, po polling that was really, really difficult. It's, it's hard for, for an embassy. They're not structured. They're not a polling station. They're not poll workers. And so, it, um, you know, somebody on social media posted something that wasn't perfect, and suddenly that became the news item. And so it's and that's just an example about how that little extra thing suddenly becomes the story when it was mm -hmm. actually introduced as a as a as a measure to include participation. And so the point being that when things are tense, uh, when they're highly politicized, things that would be really natural and normal to include suddenly you have to think twice and three times. How is this? What 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 might be the damage be the reputational damage um, if this is if this isn't um, 
even if it's done well, if, if somebody starts um, a way of thinking about it that, that, is a, um, that undermines it, it it's, it's tough. Yeah, indeed. And indeed, while uh, there are many countries that uh, are sort of uh, trying and testing and introducing or accelerating many of these, it seems to be the Indonesian story is more like that uh, where the EMB would need would need the extra push or the persuasion to to try, and of course they would they would also need the legal frameworks in place and infrastructures in place. And uh, but I, I and I don't know how much in Indonesia's case maybe there is that what you uh, referred to Therese in your in your talk about the the E Day as the the right and the ritual of the the very act of community uh, coming together. Um, whether we are, are we in danger of losing any of that? Uh, while if we are extending uh, the the dates, and if it becomes one mundane affair to do when you are visiting your shopping mall, uh, that's certainly for me. And I know that in in Australia, that's uh, that's something different as as it would be in India, in Nepal, and in in many countries still. The the E day is the the election day, and it carries many meanings. Um, but um, but I would imagine in most places we indeed are moving sort of SVAs as complementary rather than uh, replacing. But um, countries are in many in a very different uh, pace on on what it comes to 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 that. Um. I, I see some of the more technical questions here, which I can't yes. answer, but I think there are people who can. And also I saw that there's someone from the Victorian Election Commission here. And I'm just curious about why um, social media um, was picked as something for, for legislative inquiry. Was there something particular in, in mind? Has something happened? So just, just a few, I'd love to hear from some more of the, the participants, both to answer some of the more technical questions in the chat section. If you think you have the answer, um, I'd love to hear it as well. And, and also um, if this social media and reputation has been a problem in Victoria or any other place, um, any other um, Australian uh, area or, or, or any of the um, Asian countries, if, if social media has this, this idea of, of something the reputation being tarnished um, of, of some voting arrangement. Hmm. Yeah, no, uh, please do, um, do come forward <laughs> if you have you have anything, um, any advice or <laughs> story. I, I, I do work for the Victorian Electoral Commission, um, but I work in the education and inclusion team. It's Deborah Taylor here. So I'm probably not the best person to answer you in terms of my colleagues in my comms team would be perfect, perfectly suited <laughs> to answer you. Um, I know that social media has, um, I guess, in terms of listening to community, social media is something we need to to work with um, to make sure that information is being, um, you know, understood and explained across all different demographics in the community and their platforms that are picking up more and more in terms of being able to get information out across to people. So um, that there, it, it would be, I guess it, it just, it, it just wouldn't seem right not to use those platforms, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure in terms of more the more technical terminology and everything, my colleagues would be better answered. But so, so Deborah, it's just that I saw that there was a, a, an inquiry on this in, in the Victorian parliament. I think it was Victorian or South Australia. Was it? Um, but, so I was just wondering if there was uh, any disinformation problems that have been experienced. But um, but of course, uh, social media as a, as a vehicle for, for yeah for education is you guys do beautiful work. That's yeah. I've yeah, had the I pleasure of, of seeing that in Melbourne. Um, the the extraordinary work that 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 the the election commission does down there. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, my colleagues would be best suited to to no answer worries. that. It's all. I it's can't all see the different list to see if any of them are here. I'm so sorry about that. No That's worries. Okay. No. 
Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for thank you, Deborah, for that. And and indeed, I think we had a couple of questions on the sort of online uh, Internet voting and the authentication and techniques and vulnerabilities of servers and all that. So um, uh, we probably um, if anyone has any any interesting insights there, but otherwise I would advise really I was listening yesterday a very interesting uh, presenter from Estonia, which is really the country leading the way on e-governance, on e-voting, on e-everything. Uh, you can be an e-citizen of Estonia or apply to become one. So um, I think they they kind of uh, mastering this. And I know that many countries are still struggling with, with the uh, many of the security aspects of, of this, but obviously, um, Somehow, we, the world it needs to be and is probably moving to to that direction. But there is a lots of lots of issues and technicalities there um, involved. Um, we have also just to let you know we are coming the last ten minutes of our session together. So we have opened our um, the uh, post lecture survey, which is open and which will be uh, running for. Um, for 15 minutes or also, um, also after. And uh, and when we end, there will be a sort of a evaluation survey that will be available once we have uh, ended uh, the, uh, the event. Um, I believe we are sort of running out of the questions from the from the um, from the audience itself. Um, I'm wondering if I can um, call on both Adi and maybe Kate Sullivan if they are up for um, partly answering some of the questions that are there. These are colleagues that I very much trust on on these on these topics. Um, Adi, did you want to speak about the, for example, the the migrant voters issue, or else um, some of the questions that were in the chat? I put Adi on the spot. Yeah, he's um, mastering all the um, our our. Oh, right, he's doing all that questions <laughs> and all all the polling questions. So yeah. I think we are. We have to leave him. <laughs> let him. Let him do that. Uh, those questions. Yeah. I think the that's the that's exactly the question. Some of the questions looked at issues of. Early voting, like how early? How early can would you would you vote? Also, in thinking of the uh, ongoing uh, U.S. elections, where uh, was it? Sixty million votes have been already casted, and we still have uh, already we got to before before the the elections. And some questions came up in one of the yesterday's debates. So what? What if some scandal comes out in this week, and then you wouldn't? You cannot. Uh, Get your ballot back, but I suppose that's that can happen even after the elections, and and you cannot get your vote back in in that case either. But these are this, these are about one of those questions: how early is too early? And yeah, exactly, exactly. At what point does it start? Be it stop? Be, you know, has, yeah, does it stop being elections? So I think here in Sweden, it is um, really early. It's like. Um, I, I want to say 40 days, but that's probably too much, but it's, it's really, 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 really early and it's super convenient um, just on your way home. Uh, so uh, more than 40% of Stockholmers use that. Um, and I know that in terms of the answer to Hadar's question about the local elections uh, coming up, the reason I mentioned Kate Sullivan, I thought of her because I know that she's been thinking and I don't want to speak for you, Kate, so you can speak for yourself. Um, Kate Sullivan is a formerly Australian Electoral Commission, but has now, she, she's one of the leading people who understands how the US elections work. So when it comes to learning from the US elections, um, she's really the, the right person for, for that. But um, she's been thinking, I don't mean, if you're ready to speak, you can speak yourself, but that multi-day, like just extending the time of, of voting is really the easiest way to accommodate the COVID-19 crisis. It's just the simplest uh, compared to the other methods. I don't know if you want to add anything, Kate. Sure. Uh, good morning. Um, so I can't actually see the the questions, but um, I mean, I think the, I think the, the topic of, 
of multi days is a really interesting one. And in part to answer Lena's point, uh, I used to work at the UK Electoral Commission as well. And in 2004, we had a lot of all postal voting in some regions of the country where there was only postal voting. And that was also, uh, it was a European parliamentary election and very close to the end of the election period, there was a terrorist attack in Spain. Uh, the bombings on the on the trains in Madrid. And we did some polling as to whether that had changed people's mind in the last week of the election campaign, whether they changed their mind on how they wanted to vote and therefore whether that impacted because many people had already voted by post by the time the event happened. And in fact, there was a negligible difference. People had their own political views already and it wasn't changed by that particular event or by anything else in the campaign that happened after they voted. Um, I mean, I think because, because as Michael said, that the minute you take voting outside of a polling station or a polling location, you've automatically uh, taken away the guarantee of secrecy that the polling station is there to deliver. So certainly I would say that multi-day voting uh, answers that problem in that it's, it's, there's more options for people to vote, particularly in America where it's a, a weekday voting. Um, it gives people a chance, multi-day voting gives you a chance to vote when you're not at work or when you're not meeting your other obligations. Um, but it still provides that secrecy, but also that assistance because voting outside the polling station is also inaccessible to many groups and societies, particularly people with disabilities. They have no access to assistance if they need it. And um, multi-day voting provides all of those things just on more than one day. Um, so I think that you're right, that that is the, the best option. And if a society can afford it and can manage it in a safe and secure way, then that's the answer to COVID problems. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, and indeed, and of course, this is um, there is the other other dimension of in many countries the campaign period are, are very short, and actually, when you you know the names or uh, qualified candidates' names, very late, and that's also sometimes because of the the uh, reduced campaign time in order to reduce the influence of money in elections. That was one of the reasons in India and in, in Mongolia. So it's this balancing act between between all these all these different um, aspects uh, we we have. I think we are coming to the end. We have only a couple of minutes left. Uh, so uh, actually this this topic of uh, we will be hearing uh, in two weeks time in on 11th November, the same time from uh, Ju Jong Tam about the exactly this issue of of the um, the impact of the distant and online election campaigning uh, impact on funding of election campaigns and political parties. So tune in on, on 11th uh, November 20, uh, 2020, uh, 3 p.m. Australian Daylight Saving Time. Um, and um, again, uh, there is a request to me to ask you to fill in the post lecture survey, if not already done, it does provide us very uh, valuable uh, valuable information. And there will be a post election uh, evaluation or the um, uh, sorry the evaluation survey available once the event has ended. But um, I do want to thank you, thank you all for for your questions, for for being uh, part of this uh, part of this lecture. For uh, also for all the Facebook uh, watchers uh, and everyone who, who registered through through Webex, and everyone who gave their contributions and spoke, and particularly of course uh, my warm thanks to Therese uh, for Pierce Lanela for uh, for this wonderful lecture and very thought provoking questions and thoughts and. Um, and for waking up so so terribly early in it's, in, it's getting light outside. You can oh, I can see, I can see there is a little <laughs> bit of light there uh, outside. Um, and as you said yourself, this uh, so many unanswered questions still, and many interesting, interesting aspects to the special voting uh, arrangements or whatever we want to call them in in future. And uh, we are working on this, our team in uh, in Stockholm and we in here in Canberra and IDEA as, as an institution and many, many of the other uh, 
uh, organizations are working on this on on this issue. So please do send us your thoughts and ideas or experiences. Uh, we are very much uh, interested in hearing from you. And uh, thank you all the friends of IDEA who are part of organizing this lecture series and uh, sharing sharing the information through your networks uh, on this. Hope to see you all on 11th November. Uh, thank you again and uh, bye for now.